prepared 300 Thanksgiving meals. Uh, and and uh, the Love Lunch Sack Ministry took those out. So I've asked Michelle if she just wanted to share a couple of things uh, about that. Good morning. Yes, actually, it was over uh, 300 meals. So we asked, that's what we were shooting for is 300. It was over 300, plus we had two, I think, or three big old things of uh, chicken legs and leg quarters and stuff left over. So we got to bless uh, some families um, that have a lot of children with food for the rest of their week. Um, and I just want to tell everybody here, thank you. You know, can't do it by myself. It's you guys working together. And, and the blessing, I don't want to it's all right. But uh, it's a true blessing. We also had other churches come. And Amen. the Lord just so showed me that this, how everything worked, because it was all so smoothly. <laughs> everything worked so smoothly. We got all the lunches done. We got them there. They were still warm to the different houses. We had plenty of people to drive, plenty of people to go out. Um, and it was just the body of Christ functioning as it should. <laughs> everybody doing their part and it was so neat because even as I, I prayed over every everybody in the vehicles and the lunches and we were about to go out and I stopped because I forgot there was a flyer I needed to hand out so I'd made everybody you know I flag and everybody jumping out of my vehicle stopping everybody and they stopped and this is what was just a real blessing it just showed me how how the body of Christ works I come back in to grab the flyers and all the tables are already down Everything's almost already cleaned up, and I didn't have anything to do with that. It's because of those that were staying behind took care of all that. And that just, that was so, I, well, the people that were riding with me saw me. I cried all, all the way there because that just is, I mean, just shows how when you're doing your part, everything runs so smoothly. When you're not looking at what somebody else is doing and trying to do their part and and I'm not trying to control everybody's part. When God's just controlling it, it all runs so smoothly. Anyway, it was a true blessing. We blessed so many, so many families. Um, and they were just, we had not told them we were doing hot meals. So everybody was very surprised. So anyway, I just want to tell you thank you very much for all your help. I appreciate it. Amen. Give yourself a big hand clap. All right. I've said this for a long time. Teamwork team together everyone accomplishes much many hands make light work just like michelle said everybody pitched in nobody had to just overwork themselves and we got to do some great ministry in the process so again give yourself and the lord a big hand clap for that amen <laughs> glad to be a part of that part of what they're doing if you want to be a part of that they'd be glad that they go out every week except the first sunday of every month and so uh, if you want to be a part of that, you see Michelle. We've been working on for uh, several weeks now in uh, guardrails, in case you didn't catch that. <laughs> We've been working on guardrails. And uh, guardrails, as far as this world goes, as far as the secular world goes, uh, guardrails are something we don't pay that much attention to until you need them. And it's a system that's designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas in other words uh, they're on bridges uh, curves unexpected changes in road conditions all kinds of things like that we've talked about this for several weeks and kind of the the preface behind all this thing is uh, we wondered what it would look like if we took and put guardrails in our lives in the areas where we have weak areas in, in our lives where we're prone to be tempted in areas where we're prone to run off the road where maybe we've gone off the cliff a few times and if we put these guardrails up before that time if we put a guardrail up before we've run off the cliff before we get off into the ditch uh, it's very very possible that we could have avoided the biggest regrets in our life all of us have some regret some of them really, really big regrets in our life. Things that we wish we hadn't done, places we wish we hadn't gone, we were in wrong place, wrong time. All these kinds of things. If we'd have taken the time, ahead of time, to, to put a guardrail in that area of our life, it's very, very, very possible that we would have been able to avoid the greatest regret in our life. And the thing is, if we, if we continue to do this and continue to look at... How many of you have noticed guardrails that you never noticed before? 
Amen. I saw another sign, guardrail damage ahead. It was on the East Tex, uh, right there where 10 and the East Tex come together this last week. And I thought, boy, there's somebody else getting down the guardrail. And if, we, uh, if we'll post these things, it's the, the thing about a guardrail is it's not in the danger zone. It's actually a few feet or a few yards back from where the real danger is. And the, the, the idea behind it is you might cause some damage to your car if you hit a guardrail, but it'd be less damage than if you go off the side of the bridge or off the cliff or into the ditch or hit a tree or whatever it is. And so what we're doing is in our, in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual lives, we're deciding that we're going to put some guardrails there that if we get up against it, we get close to it, it will trigger our conscience. Our definition of a guardrail is a standard of personal behavior. It's personal. It's for you. It's not for everybody. My guardrails are going to be set in different areas than your guardrails, possibly. But it's an area, a standard of personal behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. And in other words, whenever I post a guardrail and then I'm, I'm, I'm going through life and I get close to my guardrail, that somewhere down the line my conscience ought to trigger. It ought to bother me that I'm getting close to where I have set a guardrail. So we've been working on that. And here's the thing. Any area of our life where desire is, a, is an issue. The things that we desire in life, we need to set guardrails. Uh, in areas where power is concerned, in areas where success is concerned, in areas where money is, is involved, in areas where intimacy, uh, relationships are involved, where achievements or academics are, are involved, we need to set guardrails. And the thing that we, we live with an internal conflict as human beings is part of the human condition. Just part of who we are, how we're made, and what we deal with in life. There is always a conflict between our values and what's right and wrong. There's always a conflict between the oughts and the ought not. There's always a desire between fulfilling a desire immediately or postponing that so that we might get something better down the line. So many times people say, well, I don't want to set a guardrail in my life. It's keeping me from getting what I want right now. There's something good over there, and I want that. But here's the thing. If we'll set that guardrail and we'll postpone that, sometimes we, we end up with something better down the line. But we, we deal with that. We don't, you know, we'll say, I don't want to be careful. I don't want to live my life carefully. I just want to have fun. Don't raise your hands if that's you. I'm just, I'm just saying. Some of us think that way. I don't want to be careful. I want to have fun. I don't want to study I want an A. Doesn't matter how I get it. We say, I don't want to save. I don't want to be financially responsible. I want now. I want that. I want to be there. I want to lease this. I want to buy that. And we don't live fisc financially and fiscally responsibly. We, do, we don't say, we don't, I don't want to work on a difficult relationship. I want a new one. And we don't think about these things. We, we, we just, you know, I don't want to be a role model. I just want to be happy. I don't want to eat healthy. I want to eat that now and bunches of it. Oh, me or amen, I don't know which. <laughs> I don't want to be wise and prudent. I want to have dinner with her. Amen? You see what I'm talking about? And so many times what happens is we don't put up guardrails. You can't, it's very, very difficult to jump out of the car and set a guardrail where you need it. You got to do it ahead of time. And if we don't take time right now, today, to set guardrails in our lives, in the problem areas, then somewhere down the line we're going to wish we had, we're going to look back and say, I wish I'd have taken time to, 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 to set that guardrail. Some people say, well, it's unnecessary, it's annoying, it's obstructive. But here's the thing. When you really need a guardrail, you're glad it was there. So, the thing that I want to tell you about today, and this is, this is one thing I know about human nature, that no matter where you set a guardrail, it doesn't do away with the tension. There's always going to be a tension that you'll feel about making a decision. 
And here's the thing. I know I've known people that have lived their whole lives. And, you know, here's the thing. We're talking in a, in a metaphorical sense. I'm not talking about setting, you know, I don't want you to go out and set literal guardrails. I want you to do it in your life in areas where you're prone to run off the cliff. Somewhere down the line, you might decide, I'm not going to set any guardrails in my life. Somewhere down the line, you're going to put on the brakes. You might decide you're going to speed through life. You might decide that you're going to take advantage of every situation. You might say, I'm going to live my life and I'm never going to say no. Somewhere down the line, you're going to say no. Somewhere down the line, you're going to want to put on the brakes. And just because you think I can go through life and say yes, 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 somewhere down the line, you're going to have to say no. And no matter where it is, wherever you put on the brakes and wherever you say no, that's going to create a tension in your life. You know, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago about, you know, relationships and how people, you know, things that you can do to stay out of problems and temptation in areas of your relationship. Again, as I've said the last couple of weeks, that was a guideline. You know, married people ought not eat with single people. That's just one of my... And here's the thing. No matter what that is, it might be single person eat with a single person, and there might be a temptation there. Whatever it is, wherever you decide to draw the line, we talked about how it ought not eat together. But what about, I'm just going to go have coffee with her. Ooh, I want to have coffee with her. Ooh, do I want to have coffee with her? Okay, I go, I go and I have coffee with her. What, what's happened? The world hadn't blown up. I had coffee with her. But so I, I, if I didn't put a guardrail there and I went and had coffee with her, then all of a sudden I, I, I've done that. And the next temptation is I want to have dinner with her. I want to have dinner with her. I want to have dinner with her right now. So you go have dinner with her. Again, the world hadn't blown up. It's, you've not skidded down the guardrail. But dinner with her may turn into, she invited me back to her place, and I want to go in, but I shouldn't go in. Should, I want to go in. I want to go in with her. <laughs> and so, okay, I go in with her. The world hadn't blown up. What's next? So I want to go in there. I want to some of you are saying, keep going, keep going. I'm not going to keep going. <laughs> but do you see what I'm talking about? No matter where you decide to put on the brakes, it's always going to create a tension in your life. So if you put the guardrail way, way, way back here, that it triggers your conscience whenever I'm getting close, I'm still 100 miles away from sin, I'm still 100 miles from doing anything really wrong, but if it triggers my conscience and keeps me from getting over there, isn't it worth it? Because this much I know about you and this much I know about me, there's no appetite in our lives that are ever completely and totally fulfilled. There's no meal to end all meals. Wish to God it were. Because I wouldn't look like this. I'd be all thin. <laughs> There's no dessert that's going to end your desire for all dessert. There's no amount of money that's going to end your desire to have more money. The fact is, I found this so interesting. There was a, a poll done recently, and it was... The question was, what do you consider to be rich? And they gave this breakdown. You had to choose what level that you thought would be considered rich or that you would have enough money. Invariably, every person they asked always chose at least one level higher than they were. And they asked people that lived on the street, what would you consider rich? And they chose about fifty, seventy-five thousand. Boy, I'd be rich. I'd have it all. They asked people that made fifty, seventy-five thousand a year. They went for the hundred and fifty. They asked people that made a hundred and fifty a year. It was three hundred thousand a year. They asked people that made three hundred thousand a year. What would you consider to be rich? They went to the half a million. They asked the half million people, what would you think would really be rich? What would be enough? A million. They asked the millionaire, what would be enough? Five million. So no matter where we're at, no matter what we've achieved, no matter what we've got in our hands, there is no appetite 
that's ever completely and totally satisfied. There's no kiss to end all kisses. There's no relationship to end all relationships. It's, there's always the struggle that we have internally that stri- makes us drive for more. In fact, is this much I know about you and this much I know about me, if you have an appetite and you feed that appetite, what happens? It grows. That's why you can go to a buffet and eat and eat and eat and eat. Speaking from experience. There's no meal to end all meals. So the thing that we've got to do is realize that if our human nature is insatiable, that what we've got to do is is we've got to realize that we've got to set those guardrails. We've got to draw the line. And we need to draw the line way back over here to keep from getting way over there. And if we'll do that, as I've said so many times during this series, I don't think there's anybody that's ever been sorry that they put up a guardrail. In the book of Daniel, we've got a situation that tells us all about this. And if you've never read the book of Daniel, it's, it's a super great story. You need to read it sometime. But we're going to concentrate really in the first chapter of Daniel. And there's some characters that you're real, real familiar with, most likely, in the book of Daniel. Uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. How many of you just, those were just rolling off your tongue whenever you said that? Okay. You might know them by their, their aliases. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you heard of them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were actually the names that were given to them by the Babylonians who carried them away into captivity. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, this was in the year 605 B.C., before Christ. I, I think it's just amazing that we even know or have any historical record of 605. This is not the year 605 A.D., this is B.C. So thousands of years ago. And in 605 B.C., the King Nebuchadnezzar, who was an interesting character, if you've never sat down and read about him, you need to. You might also find it interesting that uh, in modern times, Saddam Hussein actually thought that he, or believed, that he was a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar and kind of schemed his life after the way Nebuchadnezzar had lived. Any of you knew that? Okay, you, you can say you learned one thing today. Okay, in the year 605... B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar was basically taking over the world. And instead of going in and annihilating his enemies, what he would do was he would go in and he would annihilate their cities. But he told his people, whenever you go in and you overcome a city, I want you to take the best and the brightest people that there are. And those basically, a lot of times, came down to the royal family. Uh, In that day and time, uh, the, the royal people were the ones who were probably a little sharper than the rest. They had had time and opportunity to be educated. They were the ones that had good food. They were the ones that had taken care of themselves. Uh, the king daddy of them all was usually the one that was very, very smart in military tactics. He was the one that went out and led the armies into battle. It wasn't like today where you have a, kind of a talking head and the armies are totally separate. Um, and so what they would do was they would go in and, and the first thing they'd do when they entered into the, to, to the capital of the, of the enemy is they would go in and they would take the young people who were the best and the brightest, mostly including the royal family, and then they'd bring them back to Babylon. Okay? And what they would do was they would educate them for three years. So in other words, they were already educated. They were already kind of smart. But then on top of that, they gave them their master's degree or their doctor's degree. And then they would give them an allotment of food from the king's table. How awesome is that? I mean, these people, most of the time, they thought they were going to die. They thought they were being carried off to be assassinated. But what happened was they got, they got the royal treatment. They got fed off the king's table. They, they got an education beyond anything they'd been educated. And then what was expected was, at the end of that three years, is they would become basically in the king's servitude as far as in his royal service. And a lot of times what they would do was they'd send them out as ambassadors for that nation because they only had good things to say about it. They'd been fed good. They'd been educated. They knew it all. So they had basically been indoctrinated at this time. 
And so what they would do was they would carry them away. And what they did for, for Daniel and his gang here, uh, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, is they, they brought them in, they gave them a haircut. Is that a big deal? To the Jewish people it was. Because they weren't supposed to trim the edges of their beard. So they gave them a haircut. They took them to the doorpost and punched a hole in their ear with an awl and put an earring in it, symbolizing they belonged to the king of Babylon from that point on. Gave them a new set of clothes. Gave them a new name. Even Daniel. Daniel was his real name, and he got the name Belshazzar. Which basically, Bel was one of the gods of Babylon. And Shazar, if you look at the translations, and there's a lot of things you have to dig through to find it, but it basically means like Bel will watch over you. Bel will take care of you. And all of these guys, Hananiah, Azariah, all these guys that got their new names, they had something to do with Babylon. So they come in and they pierce their ear, they cut their hair, they give them a new name, they give them new clothes, teach them a new language. And somewhere down the line, Daniel said, I'm not going any further. I'm setting a guardrail. You may, you may bring me in and you may give me new clothes and you may pierce my ear and put an earring in my ear. They didn't really have to work hard to do that to me. But you're going to pierce my ear and you can do that and you can give me a new name and you can call me Belshazzar and you can do all these things, but enough is enough. I'm drawing a line today. Right there. Not crossing that line. But it was part of the deal. And all the way through this process, people were being cut and eliminated all the time. And so he goes to this guy that's called Ashpenaz, who was the chief over all these people. He was basically the king's right-hand man as far as this educational process was concerned. And he goes to Ashpenaz, and, he's, and Daniel says, Ashpenaz, I would like your permission not to defile myself with the king's food. He uses that word twice in there. I don't want to defile myself with your king's food. And Ashpenaz, you know, he could have, I mean, he could have went any direction with this. I mean, he could have said, hey, hold on a minute there, cowboy. There's people out here that are starving. You ought to be, you ought to be thrilled that you're not out there in the desert starving to death. You're getting meat from the king's table. You're getting to drink all the, the king's wine. And some of you are like, hey, wine? Your ears just perked up. Anyway, <laughs> you're getting to eat meat off the king's table. You're getting to drink the king's wine. What is your problem? Can't you just go along to get along? Yeah, I'll accept, but I've set a guardrail. And this is what changes it all. If you're looking in Daniel chapter 1, it says... In verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself. In some translations it says he resolved not to defile himself. Another translation said he made up his mind, I'm not going to defile myself. And this could have cost him his life. Okay, they could have just said, okay, deal's off, you're not being cooperative, we're going to carry you out there and we're just going to kill you right here. This is what changed it all, though. In verse 9, now God. And see, there's so many times when we make a decision, and our decision seems so small to us. Oh, this is not a big deal. It's just a little thing. I just don't want to eat this. There's a lot of conjecture as to why Daniel didn't want to eat the, the food from Babylon. One is, of course, he's Jewish. He wasn't sure how it was prepared. Wasn't sure if it was kosher. He'd be breaking the Mosaic law if he didn't eat kosher food. One, one, one theory surmises that it was because this food was, the meat especially, was, was uh, dedicated or given as an offering to these false gods, this bell and there's... Uh, some other gods that we won't get into today. And that by them already having offered this to these gods, that if he ate it, he'd basically be acknowledging that they were gods. And he's saying, I don't want to do that. Whatever the reason. Daniel says, I don't want to defile myself with this food. And God was working in the background. Now, God. And it says that he gave favor... 
with Ashpenaz as far as Daniel was concerned. Daniel and his buddies. I mean, he went to Ashpenaz and he says, Hey, my buddies, my gang, my, my posse, my running crew, whatever it is, we don't want to defile ourselves. Could you see fit for us not to eat this meat that's been offered to these false gods? And Ashpenaz, we, God's working in the background and sometimes you just don't know how he's doing it and what, what else is going on. And Ashpenaz says, I can't do that. Ashpenaz says, I can't give you permission not to eat this meat because throughout history, the, the history of me doing this, we see that people do better whenever they eat. Amen? How many of you do a little better when you eat every now and then? Okay, you're with me. So Ashpenaz says, I can't do this. I can't give you permission because if, if all of a sudden you start looking kind of gaunt and thin and the king's wondering what's going on and I have to admit to him I gave you permission not to eat the food, then all of a sudden it's off with my head. But God's working in the background. And the, the Bible doesn't say this specifically, but there was something going on. And Ashpenaz says, but maybe you can work it out with the security guard. Wink, wink. <laughs> and I mean, wh where did that come from? It had to be now God. Okay, all of a sudden, this guy whose who's life is on the line, if they don't do well, I can't give you permission to do that. But maybe you can. Talk to, the, talk to the security guard. So he goes and makes a deal with the security guard and says, Hey, listen, we're going to do this. Give us 10 days. And if we're not as good looking, uh, well, maybe if we're not doing as well as these other people, then you can, you can, we'll talk. Okay? It says after 10 days they came to him and they, look, they were doing better, looked better, healthier, stronger, smarter than anybody else in this class, this graduating class from Babylon. And so God's working in the background. And in the meantime, what happened was, that, I mean, here's Daniel. He, you know, I, I want you to get this context. Daniel's a teenager. He's away from home. He's away from mom and dad. And he's not taking advantage of the situation. He's not doing what everybody else was doing. How many of us can say as a teenager we'd have turned down steak and wine? He didn't have to do this. And you know what? He would have drifted into oblivion. There'd be a missing book of the Bible. We wouldn't know anything about Daniel. He took a stand. Just because he knew this is not the way it needs to be done. He set a guardrail in his life. And he made a decision. And you know, here's the thing. He did not know the end of the story. He hadn't read the book of Daniel. If y'all looked at it, if you studied it in, in Sunday school maybe, as, you, as a kid, you see that things kind of ended up good for Daniel. I mean, he was the king's right-hand man. It, it all ended up good. fact is, this is what it tells us on down in verse 17. It says, God gave. Now, God's already been working, and now God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel a special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. So that whenever this three-year training period's done, they went before the king, and the king interviewed them, and it says, in verse 19, the king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We don't know how big the graduating class was, but these guys were the top four slots. And they didn't have to. Daniel was already smart. And what he was smart enough to do was see and predict what the end of his story would be if he didn't take a stand. Because what would have happened in this three-year period is he would have been totally converted. He would have been worshiping false gods. He would have been eating the king's stuff. And he would have totally just slid into oblivion and never, never, never done anything for God. And the reason he made this decision was because he was smart enough that he could predict the end of his story if he didn't. He made the decision not knowing what the end of his story was. God's the one that took care of that. But he made the decision... 
because he could predict what the end of his story would be if he didn't. And how does that apply to me? Some of you right now can predict the end of your story. Maybe you've got a relationship that's headed in a bad direction. And you can predict what the end of that story is going to be if you don't stop somewhere and make a guardrail. If you don't stop today and make a decision to head in another direction. Some of you, maybe it's a habit and it's beginning to get away from you and you didn't intend for it to do that. You didn't intend to go there. You didn't intend to get addicted to something. But all of a sudden you can begin to predict because you know what other has happened to other people and all of a sudden there's something on your horizon. You say, you know, if I don't make a decision today to change this, I can predict the rest of my story. What I'm telling you is you have to make a decision to change the end of your story before you know the end of your story. And so today, some of you are saying, you know, you, Brother Philip, you made me uncomfortable. You've been talking about sex. You've been talking about money. You've been talking about all these things over the last five weeks. Your prayer's been answered. This is the last week. <laughs> but before we change, before we shift gears, before we stop, I just want you to take time today and think about what is it I want to change the end of my story. What area of my life do I want to... I can predict what's coming down the line and it's not good. So today I'm going to make a decision, even though I don't have to, that I want to change the direction I'm headed and therefore change the end of my story. Every head bowed, every eye closed, If you're here this morning and maybe you're saying hey I, I've already compromised in a lot of areas like Daniel they changed my name they've given me new clothes I'm, I'm dressing different than I used to dress I'm talking different than I used to talk but today I'm drawing a line and saying I am not going any further with this I want to make a decision to change the end of my story because I can predict where it's headed if I don't. Nobody's looking around. I would not embarrass you for anything. What I want for you is good things. And what I want for you because I love you is I want you to be able to make the decision to change today. Nobody's looking around. So all I want you to do is just acknowledge it by lifting up your hand. If you would like me to pray with you, I already see hands going up. I want to change the end of my story. I want to change one area of my life that's going on. If that's you, just slip your hand up, and we're going to pray here in just a minute. Yes, 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 yes. Hands all over the building. You can put those down. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you say, Brother Philip, I don't even know God like you're talking about knowing him. But I know that I do want to know him. Maybe I've, maybe I've went through the motions. Maybe I've been to church, but I've never really given my heart to God. And you're just saying today, I just want to make things right with Him before I leave this place. Again, nobody's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to call you up front. But if today you just say in your heart of hearts, I want to make things right with God, would you just slip your hand up? Yes, yes. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray about that first. So if you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer from your heart. I want you to mean it. And I want every born-again believer to pray it with them. Just as a show of your support for the decision that they're making today. And would you just say this? Dear Lord, I ask you today to forgive me. You know all that junk that's between us. I confess it to you. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Make my my mind, my, my body, my, my soul your home. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on that cross for me. You died in my place. You died for my sin so that I could be with you in heaven one day. But I'm weak and I need your help. Would you strengthen me, lead me, 
guide me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for loving me and saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap for that.